The crew of Gemini 8, Mr. Neil Armstrong and Lieutenant Colonel David Scott, are in the pilot's ready room at Launch Complex 16, about three hours from liftoff. Technicians are checking out their pressure suits for the mission. A primary purpose of Gemini 8 is to complete the first docking in space with a target vehicle. Included in that mission, planned for three days, is a two-hour spacewalk by Pilot Scott and the first use of a tool in space, a power wrench. Suit checkout complete, the crew leaves the ready room to begin the short three-minute ride to pad 19. At another location, pad 14, the Atlas Agena target vehicle is in the late stages of its countdown. There have been no holds in the Agena count this morning. This has been the scene of seven successful Gemini launches. Today, it awaits the launch of the Gemini 8 crew. Mr. Armstrong and his pilot walk up the ramp which leads to the erector elevator. The crew is wearing the standard pressure suit, and they carry a portable air conditioning unit to cool the suit until they enter the spacecraft. The Gemini launch vehicle and its spacecraft stand 109 feet high. The erector elevator carries the crew to the white room which surrounds the spacecraft. Assisted by technicians, the crew enters the spacecraft at T minus 115 minutes. The Atlas Agena launch is only a few minutes away. Astronauts Armstrong and Scott will be kept informed of the launch, flight trajectory, and orbit of their target vehicle by the spacecraft communicator. The launch of Atlas Agena is scheduled at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And right on the nose, the Atlas launch vehicle ignites. Liftoff was normal. The Atlas has three main propulsion engines, two booster and one sustainer engine. All three are ignited at liftoff. The booster engines cut off first and are automatically jettisoned. The sustainer engine continues to burn and cuts off at 654,190 feet. Two small vernier engines continue to position the Agena properly in the latter phases of launch. They cut off at five minutes, six seconds after liftoff. The Atlas then separates immediately. The Agena propulsion system inserted the target vehicle into the planned circular orbit of 161 nautical miles. The insertion velocity was 25,366 feet per second, within one foot of the planned insertion velocity, 25,367 feet per second. No corrections were required in the Agena orbit for rendezvous. The spacecraft communicator reported to the Gemini crew, it looks like you have a live one. With the Agena in the planned orbit, the countdown of Gemini 8 could continue. There were no holes. Launch was scheduled for 11.41 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and precisely at 11.40 and 59 seconds, the Gemini launch vehicle began lifting off the pad. Command pilot Armstrong reports that the roll program is complete after 20 seconds and the pitch program initiated at 23 seconds after liftoff. The Gemini launch vehicle continues to power the spacecraft. Reports from the crew and ground indicate a good flight trajectory as Gemini 8 enters the clouds high above Cape Kennedy. It goes into the clouds, and when it comes out, an aerial chase plane picks it up for a closer look at the flight. The chase plane will continue to track Gemini 8 as it gains altitude and velocity. Gemini 8 was inserted into an orbit of 86 and 3 tenths nautical miles by 146 and 7 tenths nautical miles, very close to the planned values of 86 and 6 tenths by 145 and 5 tenths nautical miles. 
Maneuvers for rendezvous began on the first revolution. They were essentially the same as those performed by Gemini 6. This is onboard film after completion of rendezvous. We are looking out the left or command pilot's window during the station keeping exercise. The film is shot at six frames per second or four times normal speed. In the fourth revolution, just west of Hawaii, Command Pilot Armstrong reported that he had rendezvoused and was station keeping at 150 feet. The crew reported no difficulty in maneuvering in the vicinity of the Agena as they continually checked out its condition. No motion in the orbit of Agena was observed. Later, Colonel Scott would report at a press conference that the Agena was solid as a rock up there. Station keeping continued for about 35 minutes. Near the end of that time, Command Pilot Armstrong began to move in closer to Agena in preparation for his final docking approach. Both spacecraft and Agena are traveling at approximately 17,500 miles per hour. He moves in slowly and comes within approximately 40 feet of his target vehicle in this film sequence. The onboard camera is turned on again as Gemini 8 lines up with the target docking adapter of Agena. Ahead, the approach lights reflect red. Mr. Armstrong makes a final docking approach by applying small thrust increases to his velocity, about one foot per second. The command pilot will dock at 6.16 Eastern Standard Time. He will then perform a successful 90 degree yaw with the Agena. For 27 minutes, there will be no difficulty or hint of impending trouble. When Gemini 8 is about two feet from the Agena, it will pause. The Rose Knot Victor off the east coast of South America checks the telemetry. Now the Capcom gives the command pilot a go. You are looking good, go ahead and dock. And there it is, he is docked. The first docking in space. Seven hours after liftoff, an excessive yaw and roll motion occurred. With the spacecraft attitude thrusters off, the crew suspected the problem was in the Agena attitude control system. Unable to isolate the source of the difficulty there, the command pilot made a decision to undock. With remarkable skill and coolness, he disengaged his spacecraft. The roll rate on Gemini 8 began to build up. It reached about one revolution per second. The crew members were experienced test pilots and neither approached a loss of orientation. To bring his spacecraft under control, Command Pilot Armstrong was forced to fire the re-entry control thrusters. Firing the re-entry thrusters caused Flight Director John Hodge to terminate the mission. A recovery in the 7-3 zone, 500 miles east of Okinawa, was decided upon. Department of Defense forces headed by the destroyer, the Leonard Mason, began moving toward the planned splashdown point. Search aircraft stationed in Japan and Okinawa flew to the scene and spotted the spacecraft on the landing parachute in its final stages of descent. Gemini 8 landed at approximately 10.23 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was, however, early afternoon in the recovery zone. The Mason was some three hours from the area under full steam. Visibility was very good in the recovery area, and the waves were from three to five feet. However, typical Pacific Ocean swells were also present. The first para-rescue swimmer, Airman First Class Neal, a veteran of combat rescue work, was in the water 30 minutes after the spacecraft splashed down, followed by two other rescue swimmers. The flotation collar was attached by 2.11 p.m. local time, giving stability to the spacecraft in the water and a working platform for the rescue swimmers if needed. The hatches of the spacecraft were then opened and Gemini 8 was kept under constant surveillance by rescue aircraft. USS Mason reached the area at 4.17 p.m. local time. The crew was removed first and the spacecraft hoisted aboard the destroyer. An evaluation team of NASA scientists immediately set to work to pin down the source of the flight difficulty. 
Within 72 hours, they were able to announce that a short circuit in the wiring to number eight yaw thruster had caused it to fire erratically. The Agena was subsequently tested from the ground by Mission Control Houston and put into a 220 nautical miles circular orbit. It will be a passive target vehicle during the Gemini 10 mission. Although the crew was disappointed at the early termination of their mission, they nevertheless had accomplished one of the prime purposes of the flight, the first docking of two vehicles in space. <laughs>